Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Thank you. It's a real pleasure tonight to introduce to you Mr. Renard Sexton. He's a graduate of the University of Maryland. He, he writes an, a column on international affairs for the award-winning political analysis website, 538.com. And he's also a contributor to The Guardian and the Independent, two well-known uh, British newspapers. When I met him, he was project advisor uh, in, in the UN's post-conflict and disasters branch in, in Geneva, and we have worked together in Africa. He's now a, he, he is now a uh, technical advisor on institutional development at the Fondation Futuro Latino Americano in Quito, Ecuador. Tonight he's going to talk to us about conflict, natural resources, and sustainability in the developing world. Please join me in welcoming Bernard Sexton. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Or Dr. Matthew, I guess. And it's a pleasure to be here and to see you guys this evening. Um, after quite a long journey that began yesterday at 4 a.m. in Quito, and thanks to the uh, diplomatic uh, spat that's going on now currently between the Ecuadorian and, and the American governments, it took me about a day and a half to get here. But I am here nonetheless. So thank you very much for having me return. It. And I hope that this uh, fits the bill. Um, I guess I don't really need to do this because Richard did it so nicely. Um, I currently work at the Fundación Futuro Latinoamericano uh, as a project advisor on issues of institutional development and conflict analysis. Um, as, as was mentioned, my past work with, was, was with the UN Environment Program. And in the future, I've, I've begun working on a project that covers these issues in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So that kind of describes a bit of um, why I've taken an interest in this issue, and um, what kind of the context is for the, for the talk I'm going to give today. It brings together those, those issues of international governance, of national governance, of conflict, natural resources, and so forth. And as we go forward, you know, please do uh, raise your hand if you have questions or concerns, and I'm, I'm happy to answer them during the talk or certainly afterwards. To introduce the organization that I'm somewhat representing, I guess I should say that the content of this talk does not necessarily represent the point of view of, of FLA, which is the short name for the Fundación Futuro Latinoamericano. Some of them are, are FLA's views and some of them are my views, so if you meet Yolanda, you don't have to hold her feet to the fire about anything I say. We were founded in 1993 after the Rio conference by Yolanda Cacabadze, who then became the Minister of Environment for Ecuador. In the, later on, she was the, the president of IUCN and is currently the president of WWF. Uh, FLOW was founded with the goal of looking at sustainable development in the context of Latin America, particularly with an understanding that the issue of natural resources and conflict had not really been dealt with at a regional level. So FLOW was established with the, with the goal of beginning to tackle that, something it's worked hard for the last 20 years to, to achieve. And it was really beginning in the mid-1990s when, when FLA began to look at issues of conflict analysis, um, and particularly within Ecuador, but also in other countries in the region, such as Colombia, Peru, some in Panama, Guatemala, among other places. And the things that, that we do at FLA start from analysis, also holding um, dialogue sessions between conflicting parties, designing uh, courses and capacity building for government, for regional institutions such as the um, Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo, um, and as well working at, at local level governance such as um, building up <coughs> local commonwealths over natural resources. So the outline of my talk today covers a few different issues and it's really a mix of two key concepts. The idea is we know that we have a certain 
group of conflicts in the world that stem from natural resources, whether those natural resources are a causing factor, an exacerbating factor, or a victim of conflict. And we have a second concept, which is sustainability, which is the, the sort of unifying theme for this lecture series. So the question is, how do, does sustainability as a concept, as a way of, of organizing society and dealing with, with challenges that arrive in society, how does it effectively or not effectively deal with conflicts that arise over natural resources or, or environmental services? So to start with, we're going to look at these, these types of conflicts, where sustainability has been in some places used to deal with those kinds of conflicts, um, some case studies from um, three different continents, um, Africa, Asia, Latin America, um, and then Sudan, which kind of plays a um, kind of intermediary role between the Arab world and, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and then finally looking at how those conflicts, specifically these case studies, as well as the, these sorts of conflicts more generally, how they've been addressed or not addressed, and then what role sustainability might have as a tool to deal with, with these sorts of conflicts. So we'll start here at, at the global level. Um, oh, I guess I should say that we're looking at the developing world, so the tree continental world, Africa, Asia, Latin America. So when we look at the developing world in terms of conflict, there's, there's quite a bit. This comes from the Norwegian Refugee Council. And rather than looking at conflict like uh, many, many databases do in terms of battle deaths, this instead looks at it in terms of displaced people. So in all these countries that, that you can see here, ranging from um, Mexico to Indonesia, you see quite, quite a number of countries using the 2009 displaced figures that are affected by conflict. And they're connected to natural resources in many different cases. So in the case of petroleum, you see um, Iraq, Sudan, Timor-Leste, Angola, Nigeria, Libya now, which is not mentioned in the uh, 2009 figures. Minerals, which certainly have affected many of the conflicts in, in Africa. Land, which is possibly the most common natural resource-based conflict happening in, all over the world. And then also a special case of drugs, whether it's the production or trafficking of drugs and um, its interaction with land and water and what, the trafficking of weapons and as a funding source for conflicting parties. <coughs> Now, when we look at natural resource-linked conflicts, one thing we have to keep in mind is that they, they, they range in levels, to the, from the very local to the international, and with a range of intensities. So it could be that a conflict is, is very localized and, and between a few, very few number of parties that we can specifically look at and count, or it could be something much more spread out, much more um, unspec unspecified type of conflict. So, for example, when in the Sahel Belt there is a, a, a group of conflicts that are that are coming up that have been attributed to climate change and, and have been projected into the future as possibly contributing to more conflict. So that's, that's a very vague and sort of regionally focused level conflict linked to, to natural resources. Now, one contributing factor to natural resource-based conflicts in developing countries is that developing societies are um, often highly reliant on natural resources. So whether it's for economic livelihoods, social livelihoods, um, and then also for revenues for nation states. So many developing countries, particularly those that extract minerals and, and petroleum, are highly reliant on those natural resources to, to provide state budget. And this is um, kind of an obvious point, but natural resources in the environment are, are extremely important for um, the survival of human communities. Reli we rely on them, whether it's on water, land, whether it's on, on extractable um, natural resources. They, they're extremely important for the, the development and survival of our society. So naturally, um, when there is a, a scarcity of resources or if there is a, a resource that is highly in demand, it's going to bring people and communities into conflict. Now we'll move away from natural resource conflict into sustainability and, and try and make sure that we're talking from the same script here. Um, sustainability as a concept um, is, is fairly well defined in terms of having clear international definitions that have come from conferences and so forth. But many people will regard it as a, very, as a relatively vague concept because it can be sort of interpreted by everyone in their own way. So the two main ones that people use come from the Brundtland Commission in 1987 and the Rio Conference in 1992. Now the Brundtland Commission, again, is relatively vague, meeting the need 
I, I paraphrase here in both cases, the idea of meeting today's needs as well as meeting the future's needs as, as an idea of sustainability. And it didn't specifically mention whether what sorts of needs that it was talking about. It was talking about societal needs in general, but with an idea that it was related to environment, natural resources, kind of as its, as its basis. Rio was much more specific. In fact, it set out a whole, as we know, the, the, the Rio Conference Accord contains a whole list of internationally agreed uh, provisions of what sustainability is and what sustainable <coughs> development entails. And I paraphrase here, it's development that takes account of a whole range of issues, ranging from social to environmental, and that it responds to them over time. Now, when we, when we look at the perceptions of what that uh, those two definitions really um, mean when it comes to be, being put into practice, various groups with various interests interpret those, those two definitions in, in many different ways. And of course, there are other definitions of sustainability we can use, which have contributed to, to these varying perspectives. When we look at natural, national governments, and in this case, we focus on developing governments, because that's what, what we're, we're looking at in the context of this talk, um, there's a real interest in sustainability as, as a um, as a tool to allow centralized planning of the country. So that means that if we're going to uh, develop sustainably, plan how our resources are used, plan how our, our future is going to be built, it allows the central government to, to um, justify taking a large amount of, of control of the decision-making process. Um, national governments, particularly in developing countries, also look at very technical solutions often when it comes to, to sustainability. So that means what's the best technology, what, what sorts of leapfrogging development-wise can be done, and so forth. On the other hand, the international community often looks at sustainability when it's invoked as a, as a pathway for dealing with environmental concerns. And the two biggies right now, as we know, are climate change and, and biodiversity. So the question is, when it comes to sustainable development and what is funded by the international community when it comes to sustainable development, it's often to, com to, to combat climate change um, through low carbon development or adaptation, or to preserve biodiversity and, and so forth, whether it's through the JEF or um, the CBD or something else. In addition, the, the international community really focuses a lot on good governance, which is kind of a, a weaselly word because it's, again, not very clear what it means. But the idea is that governments and local uh, authorities do a better job of managing their resources. Um, and that means doing more planning, that means doing better studies, and so forth. And so international governments support that kind of thing. But again, it's not specifically um, defined what that means in many cases. Um, but rather than a purely technical issue, which a lot of national governments consider, the international community often includes social equity issues in there. The third user group that, that I include here is the private sector. And of course, the private sector is, is a very um, broad and heter heterogeneous uh, group but that often it's looked at in terms of efficiency, especially when it comes to energy or um, inputs to, to pr processes. But the idea being that you're more sustainable when you use less products, and of course, it saves you money. And they also look at, at local projects in, in places where they have, whether it's mining, extraction, whether it's dams, that uh, they have a social, corporate, sorry, corporate social responsibility um, to do some sort of local development. And that's often considered to be sustainability related. And last but not least, you have civil society. And civil society, again, is very, very broadly defined here, but there's a, a big focus on re restructuring of society through sustainability. And the idea being that sustainability has a very, very important social function. So whether it's marginalized groups, whether it's women, whether it's um, sort of uh, rural areas that have not been included well in the development process, um, civil society looks at sustainability as a pathway for including them in the, in the development and redevelopment of the, of the society. And then finally, there's a very important aspect of, of the way that civil society often looks at sustainability, which is that it's local control of natural resources that needs to be considered, which is often why there's a, a big um, breach um, gap between how civil society and national governments look at implementing uh, sustainability, as, a, as sustainable development as a concept. So with those many different perspectives, we'll just look at a couple quick examples where conflict-affected or conflict-prone countries have, have incorporated sustainability into their, their development strategies. 
we'll start with Afghanistan, who in the Afghanistan National Development Strategy have prioritized land and water as a key element of sustainable um, development and planning of their land and water as, as a development priority. When we look at Bolivia in the last 20 years, sustainability has really become institutionalized as, a, as an important element of their, of their development strategy. And that has a, a, a really strong um, social function, largely coming from the Aymara group, of which Evo Morales is a member. Um, and when I say it's been institutionalized, they actually have a ministry of sustainable development. So it has a lot of political power. They've invested funds. They've invested um, political capital in the issue. And this is, again, at the government level. And then finally, in Liberia, this is an, an example where after the, the, the main portion of, of civil conflict there, the development strategy and peace strategy that was developed afterwards was specifically entitled um, for sustainable development. That the reason that the country was working to consolidate peace and recovery was to facilitate a sustainable way forward. And then this, this slide looks at, at this issue of social um, considerations as an element of sustainability. Um, for example, in Latin America, sustainability is, um, or, I mean, in Spanish, sostenibilidad, is considered to be something that is um, as much a social issue as it is a technical issue. In some cases, it's more a social issue. It's almost a, a, um, a way to wrap up almost sort of uh, marginalized groups and almost so class struggle issues. Um, and leftist politics into a, into a, um, a sensibly environmental or, or natural resource based issue. Um, specifically, in Sierra Leone and Ecuador, we've seen that sustainability has been used as a way for states to take a, a, a stronger role in planning and, and decision making. So, even though you're decentralizing power officially, um, when planning takes place, governments um, use sustainability as a justification for taking highly centralized decisions. And then finally, um, in the th these three examples among many in the world, sustainability has been used, has been invoked as a way to justify um, uh, dealing with migrant communities, whether it's resettling them, whether it's expelling them, whether it's making um, rules about refugee camps, whatever it is. So that's a very controversial issue. Okay. So now that we've looked at sustainability and we've looked at natural resources and conflict in the world, we're now going to take a quick look at how natural resources play into conflict. And there's two main ways. The first is as a contributing factor to conflict, and the second one is as a victim of conflict. So as a contributing factor to conflict, we look at, at two main areas. First is a causal agent, and secondly as a financing agent. So in the first case, natural resources, whether they're in, in the case of scarcity, whether it's land or water, um, soils, um, or, or um, timber, or sorry, uh, wood for, for um, cook stoves and so forth, can be categorized under scarcity. The second one, which has often been called the resource curse, is where high value extractables um, and, and the um, battles over control of them um, can be a real strong global <coughs> agent. And the third one is what I call here power politics and expansion, where natural resources are a way for people in power to expand their power, gaining control of them um, and turning them into expanding their power or, or expanding their economic um, strength. In the second case, as a financing agent, natural resources are obviously a very lucrative business. So you can either sell them, which is in the first case. Secondly, you can control the use of them. So if it's an, a local market, um, Controlling access to a waterway, for example, you can get economic rent for that. And the third is a spoil of war. So if you take over a, an area, village, a country, you um, can take control of, of the natural resources there. Now, as a victim of conflict, natural resources, um, and as an issue, falls into two categories. The first is the resources themselves. So that can, includes ecosystems. It includes the depletion of non-renewables and then also the degradation of, 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 ecosystem, of uh, specific issues like land and water. So the resources themselves can be damaged by conflict or the institutions that manage them can be damaged by conflict. And that includes local management, the institutions of the state, 
um, and then also a, a loss of political will within the society to deal with the issue. And then finally, after a conflict, often there's a real disconnect between what the needs are of the country in terms of managing natural resources and the capacity that exists. Okay. Now, in terms of looking at the complexity of the issue, a lot of people have tried to make relation, have tried to explain the relationship between natural resources on one hand and conflict on the other. And what we know is that conflict is, is caused by a whole group of issues. And um, it's been described in many ways, whether it's multiple forces, whether it's kind of like a conflict soup of which you have many ingredients, conflict cycles, there are many ways to describe it. But the point is, is that natural resources are never, are, are never the only cause uh, of conflict. And sometimes they are a, a very sort of structural and, and background cause rather than a, a really proximate cause. So what we look at here in, in the next two slides is some of the complexity that makes it difficult to tease out exactly what the role of natural resources in conflict is. In the case of the level, looking at intrastate and interstate conflict, there's so many different ways to, to describe conflict. Within a state, you can have local, provincial, national level conflicts, and sometimes they interact between them. A local conflict can, can get bound up into a national political issue and therefore become nationalized. Um, similarly, national political issues can, can manifest themselves locally in a, in a natural resource issue. At the interstate level, you have the interaction between states. You also have the interaction between substate actors and states. You also have the interaction between substate actors in different states. Um, and then the issue of, of international parties that, whether it's through the UN, whether it's through former colonial powers, whether it's through non-state actors like Al-Qaeda or, or, or um, humanitarian organizations or mercenaries or whomever. When it comes to causality, what we know is that natural resources have many links with societal issues and societal causes of the conflict. Whether they're economic, political, social, um, natural resources play a, um, often an exacerbating role with structural societal issues. Uh, the second here is with environmental and natural resources as a trigger for conflict, which is based on structural issues. So, for example, a conflict over a waterway um, may be the, the flashpoint for a conflict, but because of larger structural issues, um, the, the, the larger conflict is really based on economic or political things. So, like, for example, the um, India-Pakistan struggles over the Indus River is a classic example of that. And then the this is kind of a corollary, the often structural issues in society have a way of expressing themselves through natural resource um, tensions and conflicts. So um, if there's inequalities, if there are um, excluded communities, often natural resources are, are a way that, that the issue is, the, the way natural resources are managed and distributed reflects that societal issue. And then lastly, when we look at modern conflicts, um, you, you see cycles of conflicts, and then the role of global, a globalized market, externalized um, issues, um, the role of, of international companies and the United Nations, among other international actors. Okay. So the key question after all this sort of theoretical, lots of text um, issue is how and when can sustainability play a useful role as a tool to prevent, manage, and recover from natural resource-based conflicts in the developing world? That is, it's working together with some of the conventional tools, or sometimes in place of those conventional tools, um, and in what cases might it not be particularly useful. So we're going to look at four case studies, as I mentioned earlier, Sierra Leone, Ecuador, Afghanistan, and Sudan, and just see in the practical what, what the issue here is. In the case of Sierra Leone, as it's fairly well known, um, back in the 1990s, there was a, a pretty massive and bloody conflict that took place in Sierra Leone, linked with a with, uh, conflict in Liberia. Half the population of Sierra Leone was displaced by, by this conflict. Um, and it was essentially an, a conflict between a rebel group called the RUF and the government of Sierra Leone. Diamonds played an extremely important role as a financing agent. Land and the distribution of land was a very important structural cause to the conflict. Um, 
and a, a real disconnect between the capital of Freetown and the rest of the country was, a, was an important causal factor. Um, in the end, just to tell the story a bit, the RUF, which was in many cases a, it was a pr fairly ragtag group that was, that was, included a lot of kids and was run by a few pretty crazy dudes, um, were marching on Freetown. The government hired a bunch of South African mercenaries with promises of giving them a diamond mine after the conflict um, as payment because the government didn't have any money. So again, using the natural resources really, I mean, it, it, diamonds were the name of the game in, in, in Sierra Leone. So they promised executive outcomes, this, this diamond mine in, in eastern, uh, in Koidu, in eastern Sierra Leone, as payment for their services. And a few hundred South Africans showed up, um, had a couple of big battles with the RUF, which weren't really much of a battle because it was a bunch of kids with machetes against trained former um, South African Defense Force um, soldiers. And so the rebels were routed. And the government managed to, to remain in power. And oh, by the way, Executive Outcomes was then hired by the US to do some various operations in various countries around the world. Um, and in Koida to, to this day, a, um, a, a different company that is no longer associated with Executive Outcomes still runs the, the diamond mine there. Now, after the conflict was over, and all with all this displacement, there was a great deal of, of land grabs that took place. There was a, there was a lot of communities that, that either couldn't go back to where they came from because it was destroyed, um, and so went to other places and found that other communities were also returning there. Um, There's also people with, in, with money and, who, and, and profiteers who made money during the war who then tried to <coughs> buy and buy land. So suddenly you had all these structural problems of the war. Then suddenly you had um, a, a great deal of displacement, um, highly degraded institutions. Um, so you ended up with a country that, while the war was officially over and a, a, an elected, two elected governments have been, have been brought into place, um, you have a, a, a structural situation that is that's really divided along the same lines. So the key points here, when we talked about the, the causes and financing agents for conflict that we talked about earlier, this is a national level conflict that began in the East and became nationalized. <laughs> that was financed by national resources and had a, had a really big role for the fact that there were not sufficient local or national institutions to deal with the issue. And today, those institutions are further degraded, particularly in terms of the traditional institutions. OK, the second case is Ecuador. And within Ecuador, there are a number of, of natural resource-based conflicts that are, that are pretty interesting and, and difficult. The first is over land. As we can, we'll, we'll see, land is a, a pretty important issue around the world. Um, you have campesino um, migrants who are often of mixed, mixed white and indigenous heritage who have moved from urban areas out to the countryside in the last 40 years in order to get land that had been given away by the government, essentially. And in many cases, that land was either claimed or lived on by indigenous groups. And in many cases, the government has declared either a protected area or some other um, uh, official, either protected or government development status. So what you end up is with a, a conflict between user groups over a scarce resource. In the second case, it's another scarce resource of, of fish, mainly of, of coastal fishing in the, in the western portion of, of Ecuador. What's been done, and in fact my organization has worked a lot on this, has been putting together um, a series of marine protected areas, and then second, a series of, of cooperatives of fishermen where they each agree to only fish a certain amount per year or per month. And a lot of com uh, conflicts have, have um, arisen over people that have opted out of those cooperatives and have started to fish more than their, their um, share, or from invasions into marine protected areas where um, the, often the, it's breeding ground for the fish or, or other issues. So people that recognize the environmental sensitivity and their economic interest in protecting these areas are often pitted against people that have more pressing needs, often the, the poorest of, of the fishermen. So in that case, you, you have a conflict between user groups over a scarce resource again. Now, going towards the high value resources, there's a, quite a bit of petroleum that's, that's extracted from the northern Amazon in, in Ecuador and then pumped to the coast. And there was just recently a, a, um, a big court decision that was made over between a, a group of campesinos and indigenous groups that sued Texaco 
who's now owned by Chevron, over damage to the, to the Amazon and local communities over that issue. Now, Chevron agreed to um, have the course heard, have the, the, hear the, um, the complaint in Ecuadorian, in Ecuadorian courts. And um, they recently ruled that um, several, I believe, billion dollars worth of damages were in, were in order. Chevron then said, okay, this is not, uh, the Ecuadorian courts are corrupt and therefore it's not a reasonable decision, so we want an American court to hear it, which of course was their strategy all along, and it was quite a good one, because it delayed the whole thing by about 10 years. Um, but the key issue in this case is that rather than there being violence between the parties in the conflict, it was resolved through a legal method. There was a space for each of the parties to enter their issues and, and resolve it over, sorry, and if not resolve it, at least discuss it in a, in a relatively neutral fashion. And even though Chevron doesn't, is not going to submit to the um, um, authority of the Ecuadorian courts, it still will then be, be heard in the American courts. And um, the American courts could simply say, we accept, the, you know, we accept the decision of the Ecuadorian court. So the issue here is that when there are sufficient state um, resources to, to, to deal with these sorts of conflicts at the local level, or whether it's civil society, for example, the organization I work for playing a mediating role, or in the case of land conflicts where the Ministry of Environment and other players have intervened, when there are sufficient state resources and the issues are of sufficient um, societal importance, which all three of these are, um, you can find these conflicts uh, resolved in ways that are ne not necessarily violent. Moving on to Afghanistan, speaking of violence, um, there are four main areas of conflict over land that, or sorry, over natural resources that we're going to talk about here, and there are others that we could also include. The first one is in the Central Highlands, which is a really, really fascinating case. The, the Hazara people in the central area here, which is quite high up, um, are Shias, they speak Persian, well, they speak a version of Persian, um, and they live there year-round. It gets very cold, but they, they manage to survive the winter. There's also a group <laughs> called the, the Kuchis, who are um, Pashtun nomads that basically migrate up and down the mountain depending on the time of year. In summer, they bring their herds up. In winter, they move back down to the lower areas. So each year, for quite a long time, there's been conflict over grazing land between these two groups. And um, during the, the period where, where there was either, basically over the last 30 years, the Hazaras, as Shias, have been relatively uh, poorly treated and haven't had a lo whole lot of, of support from the government. And the Kuchis also, they've also been treated quite marginally. But as, as Pashtuns and as Sunnis, they've had a lot more support for them behind it. Anyways, since 2001, 2002, this, conf this area of conflict has really, um, as well as the rest of Afghanistan, really picked up quite a bit. Um, the UN has worked quite a bit on this issue, including UNEP. In the case of Chinese investment, as you can see here, there's a very small border that Afghanistan shares with China, and uh, the Chinese are very interested in, in extracting the large amount of copper that's, that, that's there in, in northeastern Afghanistan. And there's been quite a bit of, um, I don't want to say conflict, but tension between the big countries in the region, between our, Iran, India, and China, over who's going to get their hands on, this, on these copper, copper mines, but particularly between India and China. And a little bit of Pakistan, but, but mostly India and China. Um, and so this is really where Afghanistan has played, been the sandbox for an international issue of who's going to get their hands on natural resources. Um, in the third case, we're looking at the energy and transport sector and their importance to, to improved agriculture in, in Afghanistan. And basically, illegal capture and corruption have, have d destroyed the sector. And less than half of the money spent there really gets spent on the stuff it's supposed to. And usually when the infrastructure is built, it's not built where it's supposed to be built. It's built wherever the local provincial leaders or warlords want it to be built to facilitate whatever their local interests are. So this is a, a clear example of where poor institutions, <coughs> a lack of, of state um, control of the issue is, is undermining the ability of natural resources and, and agriculture to play a positive role. And then lastly, you can't talk about Afghanistan in conflict without mentioning opium. Um, it's links to the movement of arms and the fact that it's replaced, in many cases, other types of agriculture. 
Um, it's and it's had impacts on on the the efforts to fight opium have also had some some very important impacts on the environment. So the key the key point here is that the national level conflict that we know about ideologically based between the Western powers and certain Islamic groups in Afghanistan is really not connected with these local level conflicts that we're talking about. And in fact, they don't really contribute to that national level conflict almost at all. These are, in many cases, historical conflicts, and they're conflicts that would have taken place regardless of, of the, this highly internationalized um, inter, interstate conflict that's taking place at the national level. However, the fact that there is this interstate conflict has definitely really significantly reduced the capacity of local and and national um, authorities to effectively um, manage the sector. So that definitely has um, exacerbated the local level conflicts. Okay, last but not least, we have the case of Sudan, which is a case of multiple levels of conflict, um, with all with links to, to natural resources. And in some cases, they feed into each other, and in some cases, they don't feed into each other. The first and often considered the primary conflict in Sudan is a North-South war which was recently, um, as you probably read, relatively resolved by the referendum in the South, after which they, they decided by an enormous margin to, um, to become a separate state. That North-South civil war had been going on for quite some time. Um, it's often characterized as being um, the South escaping a relatively um, oppressive northern state which controlled a lot of the commerce, had the capital, and, and so on and so forth. There's also the, the Darfur conflict up here in the west, northwestern part. The Darfur conflict was between two factions of the North-South War. So the Darfurians, for example, were recruited a lot of times to participate on behalf of the North in the North-South conflict. And what occurred was that the Darfurians, in many cases, were highly excluded from the political process they were experiencing a lot of scarcity when it came to water, land, and other things, and found little recourse in the, in the national government. And so this, this conflict um, began at the political level. And then the, the, the way the story goes is that um, Omar al-Bashir in Khartoum and, and the rulers there basically exploited ethnic divisions within Darfur in order to um, have other Darfurians and other migrant groups fight the war on their behalf. And that's what caused the whole um, uh, Darfur genocide, or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's a very touchy issue. And it's really, it's not entire, entirely clear the sequence of events still on it. Um, but I'm sure we'll find out more in the, in the coming years as people start to talk. Last but not least, you have an interstate conflict between Chad and Sudan. There's been a lot of fighting. And also here with, with CAR, with with uh, rebel groups. And there's also the LRA, which have operated all around in here. But that's, that's a different story. We're looking at the Sudan-Chad issue, which is basically where Sudanese and Chadian elites have done, done cattle wrestling and other livestock stealing by going across and, and, and getting the, the natural resources of the people on the other side. Militias, local level leaders, um, without the approval of the state, certainly. But, both of the states certainly have not intervened to stop it yet. So that's, that's really a power-oriented conflict, as we discussed earlier. At the national level, there's, there's, there's links to petroleum and the control of petroleum, as well as land. Um, in the Darfur case, there's political access and scarcity. In many cases, it's been described as a climate change-linked conflict. Um, and then last but not least, um, we're looking at a, a um, really a power and, and expansion of of economic resources issue. Okay. Now, if we compare these case studies and we look at some of the key issues that, that, that separate them, um, in Sierra Leone what we're looking at is a really a national level conflict, a really a civil war that cut across the country. And of the four, it's the only one that was really characterized in that way. And that's where it was a national level conflict financed by natural resources with very little capacity by the state or by traditional leaders to, to deal with it. In the case of Ecuador, with, with established legal roots in a fairly strong state and fairly strong civil society, the issues of access and scarcity have been really kept to the local level and have been largely resolved. 
either resolved or at least played out at the local level. In Afghanistan, you have a very separate set of conflicts, the local level and then the international conflict um, at, the, at the state level. And the main issues here are, are access and power with very low capacity. Well, low capacity for the national governments, extremely strong capacity for local warlords to control their areas. So if they so cho chose to become sustainable dudes, they um, could certainly do that. And last but not least, we have in Sudan local and international level conflicts and national, in fact, I can put that, sorry. With a scarcity in power is really the, the issues. Um, with a moderate amount of, of, of capacity in, in each of the areas, there is a fairly strong level of control over what takes place. Okay. Now, when we look at, at dealing with these kind of conflicts, the conventional methods for, for looking at them um, have been these five. Um, Multi-party negotiations has been a really common one, especially in, in West Africa, with Sierra Leone as being an example. What's, what, what was um, taking place previously in Cote d'Ivoire before the international community intervened, well, after when, the, um, when Uttara decided he was going to attack, that kind of precipitated the whole thing. But this is where you get all the, the parties around the table in a nice hotel someplace, um, and they, they try to work out a deal. And in fact, in Cote d'Ivoire, they... Um, the leaders of the various factions were in the best hotel for about three years, I guess, <coughs> working their absolute hardest to resolve everything, of course. And I think, who's, I think the French were paying the, paying the tab for the whole thing. Um, in the Sierra Leone case, they went to South Africa, the nicest resort in South Africa. They went to a really nice resort in Ghana. Anyways, so being a rebel leader can really pay off if you, if you like beach vacations. Um, in the case of Liberia and in the case of, of other conflicts, I think the Cambodia Council here, um, boycotting natural resources that are causing or financing conflict um, is, in some cases, has been fairly successful. And whether it's been successful or not, it's, it's often uh, brought up as an as a option for the, to address them. International intervention, such as in Afghanistan or what's going on now in Cote d'Ivoire, is a very, very tangible intervention. And then you have internet in, indirect interventions. So, for example, the, the way the international community and the U.S. are supporting the government in Colombia against the FARC is a, is a classic example. And then lastly, you have local state-based resolutions. So, for example, this Ecuador petroleum issue. So when, when we're dealing with natural resource conflicts, so this next section, just to explain, we're going to look at these conventional options and where, what they may or may not be able to do and what circumstances. And then we're going to swing back around to sustainability that we discussed earlier and, and have a look at, okay, in what cases will sustainability as a tool either augment or not augment these more traditional um, issues. So when it comes to these, these issues, you can hear, here see um, a couple situations that dictate whether they're useful. In the first case, you need clear political leadership, and you need institutions, and you need capacity among those leaders. They have to be able to have legitimacy to get around a table and strike a deal. What we've seen in many cases in, in civil conflicts is that people get around the table, strike a deal, and then when they go back to their groups, they no longer have legitimacy because the deal isn't, doesn't suit certain factions of the group. So for example, in Sierra, Sierra Leone and Liberia, you had splinter rebel groups that, that, that broke off and continued fighting even after the official conflict was over. In the case of boycotts, you have to have something to boycott, obviously. So you have to have a specific resource for which there is an international market. And then secondly, you have to be able to ensure that there's not going to be a humanitarian ca catastrophe by boycotting that resource. That could just exacerbate the whole situation. Um, in the case of international interventions, um, you're, the only, you can only fight against a military act. When you're going to bring in military actors, you usually want to be fighting military actors. As we've seen in many cases, when there's very dis disperse guerrilla groups, un undefined groups, it's often very difficult to intervene with UN peacekeepers or conventional military. Also, when international or regional security, like in the case of Cote d'Ivoire, is at stake, it's worth it to bring in an international intervention, often from regional troops. In the fourth case of indir indirect things, um, it's got to, you have to have a state institution that you can support. So the, the state has to be able to control things um, relatively well. So in the case of Colombia or in Ecuador, 
you have a much stronger state than you would in Af Afghanistan or in, in Ecuador. And in fact, or sorry, in Sierra Leone. In the case of Afghanistan, they're trying to do this, but because the state is, is not very strong, it only controls certain parts of the country, it's quite corrupt, they're having a real, real hard time exec um, executing this. And then the issue of, of structural concerns. If structural issues, whether it's inequality, whether it's marginalization, control of resources, is really at the, at the root cause, just supporting the government in its fight against a particular conflicting party is not going to deal with the conflict. And then finally, in order to use local state-based resolutions, you have to have a state that works that's not significantly challenged by, oops, by the conflict. And it's particularly useful when it's a localized conflict rather than a national level. Okay, and then the converse, when, when do they not work? Well, they don't work when the, the first, you can't have negotiations when it's a, a highly localized issue and there isn't sufficient governance to, to convene the whole thing. In case of boycotts, when it's more structural rather than specific resource based, obviously it's not going to work. Or when, oops, what is going on here? Um, <coughs> when humanitarian issues might just get out of control. Um, in the case of international intervention, sometimes bringing in external parties just um, escalates the whole conflict, so you want to avoid that. And then, similarly, when there are structural societal issues that a military force is not going to be able to deal with, obviously that's not going to work. And in the last two cases, when you don't have, when you don't have a strong state, you don't have strong institutions, they don't really work very well. Okay, let's go back to sustainability. Um, when we look at sustainability, as, as whether it comes from any of those four perspectives that we talked about, whether it's from governments, civil society, international organizations, um, they, sustainability might be useful in a couple of different areas. Particularly when scarcity and overextraction, <laughs> such as in the Sahel region, are, are a leading cause of conflict, bringing in the, the, the principles and the framework, the paradigm, so to speak, of, of sustainability can be really useful in terms of reorganizing the society under the new conditions, recognizing the scarcity that exists and, and reorganizing things, whether it's at a social, economic, or environmental level. In the second case, sustainability is really useful when you can wrap up social and economic structural issues in the language of sustainability, like we were talking earlier about Latin America. When you can take those structural issues of gender, whether those structural issues of ethnic, um, ethnicity and race, religion, and explain them at the decision-making level in terms of sustainability, it becomes a lot easier to, to resolve them. The third, third point here, um, when you can take, and this is kind of the converse of that, when you can take natural resources management and disconnect it from the ongoing conflict in, in the society, such as in the case of Afghanistan, the, which is an ideological conflict, you can often um, use the language of sustainability to deal with other issues that um, of natural resource management that otherwise might get just sucked into the larger ideological issue. And then finally, and this is possibly the most important one, sustainability only works when at the political level, medium and long-term thinking are, are viable options. Um, when there's continued crisis, it's not a political option to, to talk about medium and long-term thinking in a very serious way, and certainly as a paradigm of development. So in the case of Sierra Leone, for example, in the, in the years that followed the resolution of the conflict in 2001-2002, you couldn't talk about sustainability in a serious way. But now, um, as, as Richard and I found in, in the last couple of years, people are much more open to it as a, as a paradigm of development, as a way to kind of um, rebuild society in a way that will resist conflict in the future. And then finally, what are some areas where this, this concept really won't work? Um, when short-term considerations are really leading the, uh, at the top of the, the priorities list, um, such as what's happening in Eastern Congo at the moment, although it's subsiding a little bit, it's good, we can, we can say. Um, those considerations are, will, will definitely overrun, <coughs> override sustainability as, a, as an organizing concept. Also, when natural resource issues are really bound up with political, nationalistic or ethnic identity, introducing sustainability is not going to get into the get to the heart of that conflict. So for example, in Timor Leste, it's just it's not going to be a, a, a conflict um, management or risk reducing element there. 
It might work for other things, but it won't work for that. In the third case, in many cases, sustainability is not a particularly useful term and not a particularly useful way of describing what is essentially a political, economic, and environmental reorganization of society. Now, I don't have any specific case studies here, but in many developing countries around the world, people say, well, that sounds like something that the people in the North should be dealing with and not us. And then fourth and finally, when a conflict is really built on structural issues that are related to natural resources, but among other things, such as is the case in Sudan, um, if sustainability is not going to, to, to take care of that issue and resolve it, and of course, splitting up the country is a hell of a way to resolve this, but um, sustainability couldn't have done that. And uh, that's kind of where we sit on that. <laughs> so um, there are some cases where, where sustainability really will, could, and, and should play an important role in terms of um, managing conflicts and then making, com making societies more resistant to natural resource-based conflicts. And in many cases, um, it just doesn't quite fit the bill. Okay. There, there we stand. <laughs>